Welcome to the uh, what's the 90th the 90th annual meeting of the Brookfield Historical Society. But this is the <laughs> this is the first time in three years that we've been able to to meet in person due to you know what I won't mention the name uh, and, and we are we're very grateful at least I am to to be able to once again uh, meet with friends and neighbors and and break bread together <clears throat> before I proceed I might explain that this is being recorded by Orca which is the Onion River Community Access. That's, that's what it is. Yes, uh, and so if you have some reservations about being recorded or having the back of your head photographed, you should raise your hand or maybe we can, we can move, move you. So the, 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 the program, uh, this evening's program will run like this. Uh, first of all, we have to have, uh, necessarily uh, have to have a, a business meeting, which will be very, very short, or I'll get into trouble with Perry Kasich. Uh, and that will be followed by the presentation by our guest, Amanda Gustin, on uh, Justin Morgan's horse. Uh, I'm sure that that's the primary reason why you're here not the business meeting. And then after the business meeting, after Amanda's presentation, uh, we'll have the potluck supper. If you didn't know about the potluck or weren't able to bring anything, don't worry. There's, there's plenty of food for everyone. And we hope that all of you uh, can uh, join us, break bread together. I'd like to, before we conduct an election of, of uh, trustees, I'd like to run through the highlights of activities uh, during the past year. Uh, first of all, by pointing out that <clears throat> after two years of what might be called intensive, uh, intensive effort, uh, concerted effort on the part of many volunteers a major restoration project was completed uh, in the historic Marvin Newton House. Uh, that, that work involved uh, the central hallway uh, and four, uh, uh, four of the rooms, four of the exhibition rooms. Uh, it involved pretty extensive plaster restoration. Uh, it involved sealing, whitewashing, uh, it involves uh, painting, uh, it involves wallpapering. Uh, and before the grand opening that, that revealed all of these improvements, uh, grand opening uh, last August uh, on the occasion of the ice cream social, uh, all, uh, all of the exhibit rooms had been reconfigured and a number of new <clears throat> exhibits had been installed. And all of this work depended heavily upon uh, volunteers. And <clears throat> I'd like to uh, quickly uh, identify and express appreciation uh, to uh, these volunteers. Th this is in no particular order. And if you want to read the details uh, about this in the curator's report, uh, you're welcome to take one of these newsletters. You're also uh, welcome to join the society if you're not a member. Uh, and if you do join as a new member, you get the latest history of Brookfield free. <clears throat> Otherwise, it's $15. So uh, here, here, is, here are the, the, here's a listing, a quick listing of the volunteers to, to whom we're so grateful. Uh, and again, this is in no order. 
no special order. Uh, Skip Buck uh, and Elaine Mangy Buck, Sarah Isham, Alexis McLean, uh, uh, Greg White should be cited for his uh, indef indefatigable efforts at painting trims and mullions, measuring and cutting picture rails, uh, and repairing windows. Uh, Charlie Ballou, uh, raise your hand, Charlie. Uh, Charlie. <laughs> Uh, is appreciated for single-handedly wallpapering three of the restored rooms. Uh, and uh, you're not for hire, are you, Charlie? I'll defend the price is right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, others include uh, Pat Mayer, uh, Luk Lukina Andriev, uh, Blake and Melanie Riddle, Jeremiah Kemberling, Ilya Andriev, uh, Dimitri, uh, Dimitri here, uh, uh, should uh, should be uh, c congratulated for painting and hanging picture rails, scouring rust off ornate stoves, roping beds, and creating ingenious solutions for uh, display problems. Uh, Amy Borgman uh, uh, should. Uh, receive appreciation for her tireless work in updating uh, records with object locations and cataloging, cataloging collections. The, per the person I haven't mentioned, though, yet, uh, is, is uh, Rachel Andrieff, our, our curator. Uh, Rachel was really the primary force uh, in bringing all of this, all of this together uh, to a successful conclusion. And finally, I might <clears throat> mention our two summer interns, uh, Samantha Flint, who's now a, a student at uh, the Vermont State University at Castleton, uh, and Riley Langdon, uh, who attends uh, Warren Wilson College uh, in in North Carolina. Uh, they were responsible for carrying out numerous projects during the course of the summer. And they, they infused us with what might be called youthful energy. Uh, and uh, they were a source of fresh perspectives. And we hope uh, that they will return uh, as interns this coming summer. Uh, I want to uh, mention public outreach projects uh, that were conducted in the course of the last year. Uh, the annual, actually this was the 20th annual uh, ice out contest that occurred last spring. Uh, we were involved also with the, the History 252 project. There are 252 towns in Vermont. This is a project initiated by the Vermont Historical Society, and they uh, asked each town uh, that could respond uh, to offer them a story, an interesting and unique story about their community. And so the Brookfield Historical Society uh, sent, uh, presented a story entitled uh, Brookfield's Public Library Vermont's oldest public library in continuous operation. <clears throat> Again, the uh, Historical Society mounted a photographic exhibit uh, in, in Hippo Park, uh, and that should come down soon, and that uh, had the, had its, has as, as its central theme uh, the history of farming uh, in Brookfield. And complementing this display uh, was an exhibit that was mounted in the, Mar in the Marvin Newton House, the Brookfield Historical Society, uh, an exhibit consisting of uh, agricultural implements that were drawn from the society's collection. And also related to the farming theme was a program, a presentation uh, by Keith Sprague on the uh, history of dairy farming 
in, in Brookfield, before a, a packed audience uh, in, in the Old Town Hall. And I should add that uh, this, this presentation was made in conjunction with uh, the uh, Brookfield Community Partnership. The, uh, the, the, the last projects that I want to mention involve the garden, the Newton House garden, uh, and, and wall, uh, retaining wall on the south side of the house. The, uh, the ongoing improvement of, of the Newton House gardens uh, is under the direction of uh, Sid McClam, who's the, uh, the project coordinator uh, who serves as, uh, as the, uh, as, as an agent, I suppose you would say, of the uh, UVM, University of Vermont, uh, Extension Master Gardener Program. And Sid uh, managed, is Sid here? Yeah. Sid managed to uh, in, enlist an enthusiastic core of uh, volunteer gardeners uh, that I'd like to uh, mention by name. Uh, they included uh, Nicole Conti, uh, Master Gardener, Holly Dustin, Sterling Giles, Sarah Isham, uh, Linnea and Ron LaPearl, Elaine Mangy Buck, Liz Parker, Master Gardener, and Barbara Paulson, uh, Master Gardener. Finally, uh, the retaining wall. Uh, some of you have no doubt noticed the, the work in progress in reconstructing the retaining wall on the south, uh, south of the Marva Newton House by uh, Andy Lake. That work was interrupted by the flood in July uh, because the flood inundated Andy's house uh, and he had to switch his focus. So it's, I would say it's probably almost two-thirds complete. Let's, uh, let's go to the, the election of officers. There are <coughs> five, uh, there, there's a slate of five people who have been nominated for uh, election to the society's board, uh, and one of them, Sid McClam, uh, is is uh, is presented for a, a for a first term. The other four, uh, Pat Mayer, Perry Kasich, Elaine Mangy Buck, and Sarah Isham, are slated for re-election. They've been nominated for re-election. And with this, I'd like to combine uh, the, <clears throat> the nomination of Eleanor Gray uh, as a trustee emerita. Uh, Eleanor has been on the board since 2000, uh, 2008, uh, and she's been uh, uh, invaluable for her vast vast store of uh, local history knowledge. Uh, she's not only a historian, uh, but a very knowledgeable genealogist as well. Uh, and, and we're hoping that as she moves to emeritus status, uh, that she can continue to serve as a resource for consultation on local history matters and also uh, genealogy. So that's, that's the slate. Uh, those six people that I have identified who have uh, been nominated for the positions that I have identified. I'd like to call for, uh, for a motion uh, to, to move that slate of, of officers. So moved. 
So, is there is there a second? Second. Second, Holly. Thank you. Discussion. Hearing none. All of those in favor of the motion to accept the, the, the slate of officers as proposed, say aye. Aye. All opposed? Business done. So. <laughs> the, the presentation that by Amanda Gustin uh, that you're going to hear or see shortly uh, is sponsored by the Humo <coughs> Vermont Humanities uh, through the speakers through its Speakers Bureau program. Uh, Vermont Humanities, in addition to providing public talks, uh, literacy programs, and other humanities events uh, uh, statewide, uh, seeks, seeks to to engage all Vermonters. Uh, in, in the world of ideas and foster uh, a culture of thoughtfulness uh, and inspire uh, a lifelong love of reading uh, and learning. Amanda Gustin uh, has been extraordinarily patient. <laughs> Not today, but uh, he, she's been ex extraordinarily patient as a prospective speaker before the Brookfield Historical Society. Because between April of 2020 and October of 2022, we tried five times to lure her here. But and she she agreed to come, but you know what intervene. Yeah, the word that I won't mention because it might appear again if I do. So finally, here she is uh, in Brookfield. Uh, Amanda uh, is a is a graduate of Middlebury College, where she uh, earned earned deg deg degrees in history and French with distinction. Uh, she attended the Tufts University uh, Master of Arts program in, in history and museum studies. And while uh, she was a graduate intern there, uh, well, she was a graduate intern at Old Sturbridge Village while a graduate student. And after that, uh, she served as a researcher uh, in the Mary Baker Eddy Library in Boston, and then uh, subsequently joined the staff of the Vermont Historical Society, uh, first as <clears throat> public programs coordinator, uh, and now she is director of collections. And there's something else. And access. Yes, I'm not sure what that means, but <laughs> dire director of collections and, and access. Yes. yes. So. Let's let's welcome after after three years of waiting. Amanda. Appreciate it. I uh, I hope I live up to that three years of hype. Um, I'm gonna tilt this computer ever so slightly so that I can get doing the, the very helpful what slide is next uh, thing and. Um, you will appreciate that I, I live in Barry City and it's been a very long summer, so <laughs> I will take whatever visual aid I can get. Um, briefly, collections and access, because uh, at the Vermont Historical Society, part of our philosophy is that collections um, should always be available and accessible to the public. So we wanted to build that right into the department title um, that is a newish department for us that for the first time in the society's nearly 200 year old history combines our museum and archival and library collections under one department. They had previously been separate departments managed by separate people um, and now they are, they are all together. It's not like we didn't talk to each other before but now we are, uh, now we are truly integrated. So. Thank you for that, for that very kind introduction, Gary. I appreciate it. And uh, thank you all for 
having the continued interest to keep asking me to be here, um, despite the many obstacles of this very busy last three years, I, uh, I got home from work a couple of days ago and I walked in the house and I said to my husband, I would like to go back to studying history instead of living through it, please. <laughs> I am, am sick of all of this. <laughs> um, so today I, uh, I'm gonna present to you on uh, what is actually a piece of personal research. Uh, I do quite a lot of research for topics for the Vermont Historical Society. They're not always topics I choose. That's why I'm currently the state's expert in auto racing history in the state of Vermont, <laughs> which was a, a topic, frankly, given to me, but that I did fall in love with. Uh, it's one of the perks of my job. This topic is one uh, that has been near and dear to my heart since my second grade teacher gave me a copy of Justin Morgan Had a Horse, which is probably a book familiar to many of you. Uh, I was always a horse crazy little kid, always desperately wanted a horse. Uh, as an adult, uh, my very first job after, after college was for the Middlebury College Collections, Special Collections and Archives, where I was making the incredible salary of $18,000 a year and promptly bought my own horse. Um, so uh, this sort of combines you know, two of my very favorite things, which are horses uh, and history, and well, three, if you include Vermont. So what we're gonna talk about today, I structured that title very specifically, and an historical society's membership is a great audience for this talk, because sometimes I go out and it's like a public library and it's an audience full of horse people who just want fun horse stories. But really, what, and there's some of that in here. But really what I wanna do with all of you today is talk to you about how we, how we understand history, how we record history, how we create history and create meaning from history, because this horse's story is much more complicated than just there was a horse and he did interesting things. And I'm going to make it more complicated <laughs> for you all as we go through today. Um, so that's why my first slide is a bunch of books, which I like the look of it, but it does make me cringe to have them um, block side down a little bit. So I, what I want to start with you by saying, something, some of which a lot of you already know, which is that uh, a lot of the ways in which we do history rely on documentary evidence. This is often what lends uh, credence to the phrase, history is written by the winners. Uh, the people who wrote down history, whether their own or someone else's, are often the people who got a say in, in what was history, in whose voices were heard, in how we understood a certain place or time or event. And a lot of the work of history involves seeing between the lines, or some people describe that as reading against the grain of an historical account. There may be a, an incredibly important event or moment in history for which we only have one person's short account. So you have to piece together that history in other ways. This is a lot of what uh, leads to a lot of the really uh, useful and thoughtful conversations now about telling the history of people who over the course of history have been marginalized for whatever reason. They are not necessarily people who wrote down their own histories or who were noticed by the people writing history. So it's a tricky thing. You have to think of different ways to tell uh, those stories and you have to think creatively about sources. I'm giving you that brief historiography 101 lecture to get you to how difficult it is to tell the history of an animal. <laughs> this horse was not writing down his own history. <laughs> his history was being written by the people around him. He did not have his own voice necessarily. I mean, those of us who are involved with horses know they have very clear opinions on things. Um, they're just not necessarily written down in history books um, in the same way. And which is why we're going to start our story of the first Morgan horse, uh, a, a stallion named Figure, with these two gentlemen, both of whom lived and worked between 30 and 50 years after this first horse died. So on the left-hand side there, we have a man named Daniel Chipman Lindsley. Lindsley uh, grew up in Middlebury, Vermont. Actually, both of them grew up in Middlebury, Vermont. In, a total coincidence. Uh, Lindsley grew up in Middlebury from a very distinguished, well-off family, trained as an engineer, and went west to work on the railroads, which at the time, in the 1840s, meant um, Ohio. And while he was out there in Ohio, he kept noticing these amazing horses. And they were all of a certain type, and he was just deeply impressed by them. And he said, tell me, what, tell me about these horses. And I said, dude, you're from Vermont. These are Morgan horses. <laughs> How do you not know about Morgan horses? And it turned out he didn't. 
Uh, but when his contract was up in Ohio, he came home to Middlebury, and he had become by this point so obsessed that he devoted the next couple of years of his life to writing the first ever history of Morgan horses and the first Morgan horse. And he, uh, those of you who have read 19th century histories know they don't always like hold to the same standards that we would necessarily write a history book today, which means that the way he learned about the source was he wrote letters to everyone he could think of and scoured newspaper articles and then just printed it all. He wasn't necessarily saying, I find this account more credible because. He really just was dumping it all in there, which means that uh, we get all sorts of possibilities on the Morgan Horse story in Lindsley's book. Um, but he did that important work of getting, capturing some of those voices. He's doing this work 35 years after the, the, the very first Morgan Horse died, which means that the people who have active memory of this horse, that active memory is 40 or 50 years old, potentially, at this point, or even longer. The other thing that Lindsley does, and one of the things I'm going to ask you to think about today, um, is that he, he does the very first writing down uh, of a, a kind of proto stud book for the Morgan horse breed. Think about what you think of when you think of a breed of, of horse, dog, sheep, cow, you know, whatever the animal is. Today we have a, a pretty clear conception of what we mean by a breed of animal. Um, we mean that it has certain physical characteristics that it shares in common um, with other types of that breed, and, but we also mean that there is a certain exclusivity to that animal, that it has been bred with others of its breed, and that that has been written down and carried forward. And usually there are breed associations that keep that information. No one had been doing that for the Morgan horse before Lindsley sat down to start to track some of these early horses. So in essence, it wasn't really a breed yet. And really, the this is about the moment when the 19th century conception of a breed of animal is, is just starting to form. We're talking a good 150 years of evolution of how we think of a breed of animal. So he does those two very, very, very important things. Joseph Battelle on the right-hand side, if you've ever driven through Middlebury, every third thing is named after him. Um, <laughs> He picks up this work uh, about 30, 30, 40 years later, um, reprints some of a lot of what Lindsley had gathered about the first Morgan horse, adds a little bit of extra information of his own, but where he really takes it to the next level is he ends up publishing seven volumes of stud book. He does an incredible amount of research tracking down those first generation sons and daughters of this first uh, Morgan horse. So, so take away from this two things. The Morgan horse breed is a kind of nebulous thing that coalesces over the course of the 19th century. And as it does, so too does the myth of the first Morgan horse. And also that no one was doing the primary source work really to research and learn about this first Morgan horse until between 30 and 50 years after it had died. That's hard enough to do for a human who left a diary. <laughs> It is really difficult for a horse, uh, which is why you're going to hear me doing a lot of like describing the ways we learn about the horse uh, today or the ways we know about this horse today. So now we're going to jump back in time. This is just meant to be um, an illustration uh, for you. This is a view towards West Springfield, Massachusetts in the middle part of the 18th century which is about when uh, a young man named Justin Morgan was born in West Springfield. He was one of, I believe it's 17 children, enormous family, uh, and a lot of cousins. His father had been uh, one of many Morgans. There were a lot of Morgans all around. So he's born into a large farming family in West Springfield. Uh, as a young man, he goes into farming himself. Uh, his first real appearance in the historical record is when he purchases part of his father's barn, the rights to cross the barn yard, and a portion of land a little further away, which kind of tells you how crowded <laughs> the family lands in West Springfield were, and also some interesting stuff about agricultural economics, but that's not today's topic. Uh, so Justin Morgan uh, appears in the historical record early on as a farmer. Um, he purchases land or trades land um, with family and with neighbors. He marries a cousin of his named Martha Day, and they begin to start a family in West Springfield. He does a couple of other things to earn money. Uh, he is briefly a tavern keeper, um, because West Springfield is on some major roads at this time. We're not talking like 
anything big. We're talking like his house stood near some roads and he would offer drinks to people uh, as a stagecoach stop or on the way, but he was, you know, selling liquor. Um, another thing that he did, which is relevant to today's talk, is that he started making a little bit of money as, uh, and there's a fun, fun vocab word for you, a stallioneer which is the term for someone at the time, we don't use it as much anymore, who would have been standing a, a ungelded male horse or a stallion at stud. Um, and this was his business. And this was a lot of people's business at the time. Then as now, most horse people do not keep their own stallions for breeding. They are not easy animals to manage. And also there is an understanding that you need to share genetics and need to spread genetics. So Justin Morgan and other stallioneers like him would trade stallions regionally. Uh, he might be officially leasing a stallion from someone else, basically paying rent for the year to someone else. He might buy a stallion. We have evidence that he did a little bit of both um, over the course of this time. And he would do that with different stallioneers, different men who were just making a little extra money on the side uh, by doing this. They would advertise the stallion, and that's what you see here. This is an advertisement for a stallion. It's the I'm sorry, it's a, a bad scan of a very old newspaper. Uh, but he's advertising here a dapple gray stallion named Sportsman will cover this season at Justin Morgan's stable in West Springfield. Um, dropping in newspaper advertisements saying, come to me, pay a little bit of money, get your mares bred. Very common business at the time. Sometimes you'll look at a newspaper from this time and there's a whole page of stallion advertisements of people making money this way. And you can see stallions move around the region. Um, through these advertisements. So this is relevant because of this stallion advertisement that Justin Morgan places in um, April uh, of, and I apologize, the, the year has gotten cut off and I'm blanking on the memory. I think it's like 1787 as I think the date. It's late 1780s for sure. This is a stallion advertisement for a stallion named Beautiful Bay. The elegant, full-blooded horse called the Beautiful Bay will cover this season at Justin Morgan's stable in West Springfield, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is important because this is the stallion most agree to be the sire of that first Morgan horse figure, Beautiful Bay. And this is also where one of my favorite uh, myths or stories about this first horse comes from. Um, there are a couple of reasons we believe this stallion to be the sire of this first Morgan horse. One is that Morgan himself later says, oh, he was sired by Beautiful Bay. But he could have also been like exaggerating. Um, and that's, that's probably the, most, the best reason. But one of the stories that is told about this horse is that he was originally owned by a, a British, a colonel in the British army during the Revolutionary War, and that he was stolen from that colonel and secreted away to Connecticut, where he started his breeding career as a thoroughbred breeding stallion in Connecticut, and was renamed um, Beautiful Bay. Some say his original name was True Britain, so True Britain to Beautiful Bay. Um, I think this is like a, a, an equine superhero origin story <laughs> in the 18th century. Like, is there a better lineage for the horse that is going to become the quote unquote all American horse than his father was stolen from the dastardly British and renamed from True Britain to Beautiful Bay and promptly become a, a real American horse? Um, I went into thinking, that's ridiculous. I mean, I love it, but it's ridiculous. Uh, and it turns out that Colonel uh, James Delancey, who was supposed to have owned the sire, actually did have a horse stolen from him <laughs> uh, that was actually taken away to Connecticut. So there's a, there's a little grain of truth there. Most sources agree that horse was a gelding named Goliath, not a stallion named True Britain. But there's, there, you can see there's a little bit of something there that you can, you can sort of hang a hat on and again, what a great origin story um, for this horse. So this is, this is how I'm gonna tell a lot of these stories about this horse. Like there's, there's a little grain of something there, but what's most important is the sort of shape of the story uh, it gives to this horse. So one of the other ways um, that Justin Morgan is earning money, we're gonna take a brief aside into this because it's one of the other things that people know, uh, know about him, is that he is serving as a singing master or a singing teacher uh, in Western Massachusetts. By singing master, I think like when I was a, like little and reading Justin Morgan had a horse, I was picturing like he was coaching opera singers. 
Um, it's not what we mean here. <laughs> We're talking about essentially a traveling choir director. He's going uh, from church to church, uh, teaching new hymns to the choirs there, coaching them a little bit on it, having them repeat phrasings and things like that. He might have directed the choir for a Sunday service or two as well. And he also composed his own work. We know of seven extant hymns by Justin Morgan. There were probably more, um, but it was not common to sign your name to hymns when they were published in big, uh, big compendiums at the time. Um, so for sure, he signed his name to seven of them um, th that we do still have today and that we know of today. He may have also signed others that were lost. Um, they have largely fallen out of favor. When you think of the style of this hymn, think a little bit more like shape note singing than what we might think of as a, as a more contemporary church hymn. And that's part of why he was teaching them. These are not necessarily like, you wouldn't have learned these from sheet music necessarily. You would have learned them by singing them with your choir. Um, it's going to be quiet, but I have a short video that plays a little bit of a taste of a Justin Morgan hymn next, and I encourage you strongly to, to Google for Justin Morgan's hymns. There's a bunch of them that have been uh, recorded and are up on YouTube, and they're really quite beautiful. This next one is my favorite, not only because it's named Amanda, um, <laughs> but it is really quite lovely. Sorry, sometimes it goes wonky. Okay, Google Justin Morgan's hymns. <laughs> Go to YouTube. It was gonna be very quiet anyway, and you'll get a sense of the kind of music he was writing. It's sort of incidental to this um, story. Uh, I would also note that there was a, a phenomenal UVM historian named Betty Bandell who wrote a, a really good biography of Justin Morgan that's incredibly refreshing and in that she so clearly does not care about the horse at all. <laughs> um, she's really interested in investing in his career as a singing master, as a composer, and as a, um, as a religious man and as a teacher. And, um, sorry, so she treats his hymns very thoroughly, but even within that, one of her clear theses of that book is that he made, throughout his career, most of his money farming. The singing master work was always sort of what we would call today a side hustle. Uh, it was just a little bit of extra money for him um, to add on to farming at the time. I'm glad to hear that. They're really wonderful. There's also a, a phenomenal orchestral cover of this same hymn. Um, that's just, I just put it on like in repeat sometimes when I'm in study mode. It's really beautiful. Oh, no, it is going to play. Okay. All right, sorry, I lied to you. <laughs> there we go. on for a while. Um, so that'll give you a sense of, of his music. Um, he probably wrote this one uh, shortly after his wife's passing. Uh, I don't know, you probably couldn't understand the lyrics, but um, death's like an overflowing stream, leaves us awake, life's a dream. It's, it's, it's really kind of a sad song, a sad hymn. In the late 1780s, uh, uh, Justin Morgan makes a significant life change, just mentioned Randolph. Uh, he is going to move from West Springfield to Randolph, Vermont, very close to where we are now, probably on the Randolph-Brookfield border. Um, this is uh, a big leap, but it's not that far out of, the, um, out of the realm of possibility. A couple of his brothers had already moved from West Springfield, and remember, there were a lot of them, um, had already moved from West Springfield to Randolph. And at this time, right, this is the late 18th century, Vermont is seen as the quote-unquote frontier. Uh, of New England. Uh, he went from a portion of a barn, the right to cross the barnyard, to his own actual acreage in Vermont because land was significantly less expensive. It was also full of rocks and trees. So it's, <laughs> it's hard work um, to, to farm. Uh, it's still hard work to farm <laughs> in Vermont, but it's especially hard work at this time period. Um, and I do have to note that although this part 
of the world was perceived as the unoccupied frontier free for the taking. It was, of course not. It had been historically ab inhabited by the Abenaki people. And that is a, that is a whole other talk <laughs> on the early settlement of Vermont that we can do, but I do have to mention it. The Vermont he thought he was coming to uh, was very much one that was promulgated as an open free for the taking Vermont. So he moves to Randolph, Vermont, and he sort of moves his family slowly. He goes up, he works on the land for a little while, he goes back to West Springfield, he brings his wife and children there. He's gonna go back to West Springfield a few times um, to take care of business and things like that, but he is actively farming his own land um, in Randolph. And in the meantime, um, while he's making this move, we see this newspaper advertisement appear. This is the first uh, stallion advertisement for the horse that will become known as the Morgan horse. Advertising figure, a beautiful bay horse, 15 hands high. And at the bottom there, you'll notice he is being advertised by a man named Samuel Whitman in Hartford, Connecticut. So we don't entirely know how this happens, but we are, we're pretty sure this is the same horse for a couple of reasons. The name and physical description match, although figure is not an, un think figure is like a fine figure of a horse. It's not the most original name ever. Um, so a couple of things lead us to believe this is the same horse. The timing works out, the name and physical description match. Samuel Whitman and Justin Morgan had previously both advertised the same stallions. So we believe there was a business connection between the two man that men, they had traded stallions back and forth. And Hartford, Connecticut is actually pretty close to West Springfield. And horses that Justin Morgan had advertised had gone back and forth. He had gotten horses from Hartford. He had sent horses to Hartford. So there is a, a geographical sense there. So we believe this to be, uh, the horse would have been uh, two years old at the time uh, and starting his stud career. And we're gonna jump forward to April of 1793. This is the first time that Justin Morgan and the horse that would eventually bear his name are officially linked together in the historical record. This is a stallion advertisement from April 1793 for uh, the famous horse figure from Hartford in Connecticut. There's another reason we think it's the same one. He is standing in Randolph in Lebanon, New Hampshire. You can either pay in cash or grain at the cash price. Said horse's beauty, strength, and activity. The subscriber flatters himself. The curious will be left satisfied to come and see. And he's being advertised by Justin Morgan in April of 1793. So what happened in the meantime? There are a number of different stories about how Justin Morgan came into possession of this horse. Uh, the popular story, the one that's retold in Margaret Henry's book, is that he collected this horse in payment for a debt on one of his trips back to West Springfield from Vermont. That certainly is told a couple of times in the contemporary accounts. He may have always owned the horse. If he did in fact breed this horse, which most people believe he did, he may have simply left it in West Springfield, leased it out to Samuel Whitman in an inverse of the same relationship he'd had with Whitman in the past, so that he didn't have to worry about dealing with that while he was making this big move from Massachusetts to Vermont. He may have sold the horse and then bought the horse back. We actually, we actually don't know. <laughs> what we do know is that he officially, legally does come into possession of this horse in Vermont about a month before this advertisement. And why we know is one of those fun little history bits because that winter, the Vermont State Legislature had passed a law requiring you to report as part of your grand list accounting of property any breeding stallions that you owned at a certain prescribed legal value. Today we mostly think of the grand list as like your house um, and they added breeding stallion because that was a valuable economic commodity. So we see Justin Morgan faithfully reports that his grand list personal property value jumps by the precise amount of a breeding stallion in the spring of 1793, and then shortly afterwards he is advertising figure at stud. Now at one point, people were trying to say, oh, this is the only known image of Justin Morgan and his horse figure, and I thought that would have been really fun, so I spent a lot of time reading old newspaper stallion advertisements, which are just a lot of fun anyway. Um, that's definitely a stock image. <laughs> That's like, that's like the clip art, you go to the newspaper office and you say, I like that one. <laughs> Put that with my classified ad. 
So it's a good one. It's a slightly less uh, used one, but it, it is a stock image. Uh, interestingly, this is also an advertisement in the Rutland Herald. So this is getting some, some reach. So the horse is anywhere from Lebanon to Randolph. It's being advertised in Rutland. There's, there's movement going on here. Here's, an, here's next year's advertisement for this horse figure. Uh, now he is in Randolph and Royalton. Uh, he's still uh, being bred. He's still owned by Justin Morgan, who's still living in Randolph. And here's another year forward. Uh, this is April of 1795. Now figure is in Williston uh, and in Heinsberg. Uh, and he is being handled uh, or living with a man named Samuel Allen in Williston. This is the last time this horse is linked with Justin Morgan in the historical record. It's been three years. The next time um, this horse is advertised at stud, and I apologize, I don't have a picture of it, but it is by Samuel Allen himself, who appears to have purchased the horse in 1790, sometime late in 1795 or early 1796. Justin Morgan himself is going to pass away just a few years later. Uh, of probably what we believe to be tuberculosis, although we don't know for sure. Some of the stories uh, about the end of Justin Morgan's life say that he traded uh, his horse, his stallion, to uh, another man named William Rice uh, as payment for William Rice taking care of him in his final illness. We have no record of that. Um, that doesn't appear in his will. Uh, it doesn't, in his, which went before probate court, so we have the contents of it. And that story was most told by his son, who was not living with him at the time and had not been living with him for a couple of years. His wife had passed away a few years early and he had dispersed his children to mostly his brothers and family friends. So he was living by himself uh, in a rented room, uh, very ill at the end of his life. Uh, and so his son was not living with him at the end of his life. Cannot, I, I don't think necessarily be considered a reliable source uh, for his father's activities at the time. And Betty Bandell in her biography has done some really excellent archival research that strongly suggests uh, Morgan uh, received a portion of land in Moortown that had previously belonged to Samuel Allen. Right around the time Samuel Allen says, I have a new horse named Figure in Williston. So the archival evidence Again, we have no like written, I traded this horse to Samuel Allen for land, but the archival evidence strongly suggests that, that Justin Morgan traded away this breeding stallion, which was a valuable horse, for land in Moortown. Um, Bandell believes he wanted to leave that land to his children because he had by this point was no longer able to farm his own lane and that was going to be his own legacy. And you can't leave, I think his son was, t I think a 10 years old at this time, like a 10 year old boy cannot manage the business around a breeding stallion. That's not really a useful, um, legacy to leave. So let's talk a little bit more about the horse itself. This is um, a sketch done, this is like the police uh, su witness suspect sketch of figure that was done by uh, Daniel Chipman Lindsley, basically went to an artist and said, here's how people described the horse. Do up a picture for me. And then he passed that picture around to other people who supposedly had known the horse and they say, it's the spitting image. I think it's kind of ugly. Um, <laughs> But it does capture some of what we think of as like a Morgan horse phenotype today or physical characteristics. It's got that upright, strong neck leading into a good, strong shoulder. It's got that sort of shorter back, that nice, close coupled hind end. Um, they most often still today come in bay and black. And this horse was apparently a very dark bay. Um, the head is not great, but it still shows a fine figured head, which is usually uh, a Morgan characteristic as well, a very sort of lighter, fancier head, and a very stocky horse, uh, not large. The original Morgan horse was at best 15 hands. Uh, for non-horse people, a hand is four inches, so we're talking about that tall, right? Maybe a little, yeah. yeah, about that tall. Just a little over pony height, but um, pound per pound, a solid horse. And we're going to tell a couple of stories about this horse. And a lot of the, the stories about this first horse come from or are told about the time in which he belonged to Justin Morgan. And um, a lot of them fall into that same line as what I described as his superhero origin story. Because one of my sort of 
things I want to try to communicate with you for this talk is that the ways we talk about this horse reinforce the ways we talk about the early, early Vermont history. In particular, those first few decades of the 19th century that are uh, a sort of myth-making era. This is the Vermont we want to remember. This is the way we want to remember ourselves as Vermonters. The same thing is happening at the national level for the American Republic. This is the same time period when stories like George Washington cutting down the cherry tree are being circulated to school children. It is the generation, the moment in time when the generation of those who fought in the Revolutionary War are passing away. And people are looking around saying, how do we tell this story of this new state and this new nation? And who do we want to be? And how do we want the stories we tell to reflect that? So a couple of stories uh, are told about the horse during this early Vermont frontier period. One of them is reflected here. This is actually an illustration from the Margaret Henry book by Wesley Dennis. Uh, supposedly, this was a horse who could do anything. He could plow your fields. He could uh, be gentle and take your children on pony rides. He was fancy enough to pull your buggy to church on Sunday. Uh, supposedly, Justin Morgan himself uh, rode figure from church to church when he was doing the singing master work. And one of the best stories is that, and it's fun telling this like not far from where it probably would have happened, uh, is one of my favorites is, so he was a, primarily throughout this horse's life, he was a, a breeding and sort of uh, riding and driving stallion during the spring, summer, and fall, and then he was often leased out to be a workhorse over the winter. And um, he was leased one winter by a man named Robert Evans, who was a hired man who had been hired to clear land uh, in Randolph or Brookfield um, by clear land, cutting down the trees, hauling away the logs, hauling up the stumps, grading the land a little bit. And so Evans was working him hard, and they reached the end of very one very long day, and they came down into town, um, somewhere near where apparently there was a sawmill, and what they saw when they came to town was two very exhausted, enormous draft horses trying to pull an enormous log the last couple hundred yards to the sawmill. And they were, they were done. They couldn't get it any further. Everyone is standing around going, what are we going to do now? We've got to get this to the sawmill. And Evans pulls up with this horse who has been working the fields all day, and he says, my horse has it. We've got it. Don't even worry. And they're like, you have lost your mind. Please just go home and let us figure this out. And he says, no, on top of that, why don't you put everyone here on that log, <laughs> sit on top of that log, and if my horse gets it, you owe me a jug of whiskey. <laughs> and they're like, OK. <laughs> we have nothing to lose. We have nothing else. And the story goes, they take these draft horses out of the hitch. They hitch figure up to the hitch. And he pulls this enormous log straight through to the sawmill, no hesitation, no problems at all. So uh, one of the things I always say is like everyone who has like read the Margaret Henry book or loves Morgan Horse history, you all have your favorite story. I'm fine with that. In history, it's almost impossible to prove a negative. I'm not going to tell you this didn't happen. Um, what I will tell you is the fact that people told and repeated this story says something about how they wanted to remember life in this place in this moment and how they wanted to remember the horse as emblematic of that life. This horse will work the fields all day and keep going. He can do things that you wouldn't expect. He can do things that those horses that were supposed to be doing that work couldn't even do. And the next story I want to tell about this horse, too, um, this one's not far from here either. Who knows where the Morgan Mile is today? <laughs> yeah, there we go. OK. So the next story I'll tell you, again, please keep believing this if you want to. This is one of my favorites is that Justin Morgan one day is, I don't know, he's riding his horse out and about, and he comes across these two fine New York gentlemen who have, for some reason, stopped in the area uh, with two New York racehorses, two purebred New York racehorses whose only job is to be a racehorse, and they're like taking a break or something like that, and they are just making a little extra money on the side by saying, anyone who wants, go ahead, race your horses against our horse, and we'll just pick up a little extra betting money on the side on our way to wherever we're going next. And so Justin Morgan immediately, of course, jumps right in and says, absolutely, my horse can beat both of your horses. And so as the story goes, of course he does. <laughs> this horse beats both of these fancy New York purebred race horses in, uh, in a race on the Morgan Mile, not far from today. And they still do a, a Morgan horse race on that road today to commemorate um, this story. Again, I, I'm not going to tell you it didn't happen. What I want you to think about is what it says about what we want to remember about that. He beats two fancy New York racehorses 
right, in the late 18th century, purebred New York racehorses when no one is really sure where this horse came from. Again, Justin Morgan just like showed up. He wasn't, this isn't his job. His job is to be a workhorse and a breeding stallion and he beats these horse for whose job it is to race. There's a lot going on there, <laughs> right? Like this is a great Vermont story. Um, and, we, and we sort of put it onto this horse. This horse holds these stories for us that we tell about early Vermont history. So we just saw a stallion advertisement uh, from figure being advertised by Justin Morgan in 1795. Here's the next time this horse shows up in the historical record. It's back in Randolph, the Morgan horse will stand for covering this season at the stable of John Goss in Randolph, May 1st, 1807. We have jumped 12 years, we have changed owners, and sometime in those 12 years, it's gone from figure owned by Justin Morgan to the Morgan horse. The, the myth has been created to a certain extent, and this is how this horse is now known and called. So what's happened in those 12 years? We are not a thousand percent sure. <laughs> You'll see if you Google, like there's gonna be lists of this person owned him and did this with him and this person owned him and did this with them. One of my projects and one of the reasons this story fascinates me is because so much of the story of this horse has gotten tangled up with um, repeated history, with ways that we can't prove in any kind of like court record, property transfer, newspaper, like the traditional ways in which we would prove history. Some of it has been flat out disproven, but still gets told again and again. Some of it has been very clearly borrowed from fiction and just has like made its way somehow into the historical record. It's all tangled up and it's, it's going to, frankly, we're never gonna know exactly what happened. Um, one of the things that I would love to do is go to every place we know the horse was and look through like every letter written through those years to see if anyone mentions him. Uh, it's been a busy, busy couple of years. <laughs> I haven't gotten to that. But here's my, my current best pass. It, don't, don't worry about reading all of that text. <laughs> I see you're all like leaning forward to read it. What I want you to think about are the colors there. This is the list of what is often reported to be figures owners, the owners of the horse over the course of his lifetime. It starts there with Samuel Whitman of Hartford, Connecticut, and it ends with Levi Bean of Chelsea, who was probably his last owner and uh, who owned the farm where the horse was buried not far from here. Um, I've color coded this. Green, clearly documented in contemporary sources. At the time, someone wrote it down in a newspaper, a court record, a book written at the time. So it's not much green there right? And it vanishes pretty quickly. Yellow is what I describe as documented multiple times in near contemporary sources. Let's say within like 20 or 30 years and more than one person remembers this being a thing. But we're relying on memory there and we're relying on a distance of multiple decades in some cases. There's a couple of yellow. Red is mentioned only occasionally or almost certainly disproven. Like just just didn't, didn't happen, or the only time it gets mentioned is in like, there was a, a, a book around 1900 that was one of the first attempts to fictionalize the life of this horse, and a couple of those stories get started here in that book. It's uh, online for free if you wanna read really treacly early, 19, early 20th century um, romanticized history of a horse, um, which, you know, I do, so maybe some of you do too. Uh, one of those reds, I'm not gonna name which one, is the subject of a Vermont State Historical Marker today. <laughs> so, so this history has gotten all tangled up, all confused, and frankly, like, this is, this is part of the, the thing about history, and this is partly why I framed everything for you today with it is hard to tell the history of a horse. It's always gonna stay kind of confused, which is why I like to tell this story and ask you to think about more the stories we tell and the difficulty of telling the actual on the ground facts of early Vermont history than necessarily take you through this happened and then this happened. Because that's just not as, first of all, it's difficult and it's not as interesting to me personally. We've got a few more stories to tell though about this horse. Anyone recognize this gentleman? This is one of your more obscure ones. This is President James Monroe. <laughs> He's not the most recognizable of the presidents, I'll give you that. Uh, who knows their War of 1812 history? And that sort of 18 teens, okay. 
Okay, so the War of 1812 did not go over well in the state of Vermont. This, this one, we, I promise I'm getting there. Uh, it did not go over, that's putting it very mildly, right? Again, we could do a whole talk here. Uh, all of New England actually flirted with the idea of seceding from the brand new United States because of the War of 1812. Mr. Madison's War. So James Monroe comes into the presidency and he says, I'm gonna make it up to New England by doing this extensive tour of the states of New England. <clears throat> in fact, the sort of period of history is gonna be called the Era of Good Feelings, which we should definitely bring back as a name for historical eras. Uh, so James Monroe travels all over New England um, day by day, it, it's really quite extraordinary. I mean, he spends months and months just going like old, wasn't a whistle stop tour yet, trains didn't really exist, but you know, the version of a whistle stop tour from the late 18 teens. And here's, here's, one, of our, here's one of our Morgan store stories. Um, Monroe goes to Montpelier, and in the story that is told, and this is actually how Margaret Henry ends her book, for those of you who remember, he rides a uh, figure, the first Morgan horse, in a parade a welcoming parade down the streets of Montpelier. And there are a couple of versions of the story, but he's often said to have gotten off of this horse and said to someone, this horse is amazing, where did it come from? And sometimes he says something like, Vermont breeds horses as true as her men, or something, <laughs> something like that. Uh, and supposedly he's a Virginian, he knows horses, this is extra high praise, the president likes our horse. This is, again, Fits, it fits perfectly with this, like, we're bringing Vermont back into the American fold. The president praised him. How else would we put our best foot forward than to have him ride this symbol of Vermont? The horse was probably in Chelsea at the time. <laughs> <laughs> and James Monroe, not exactly an unexamined historical figure. We know what he had for breakfast that morning. Um, and he did ride a horse in a parade, if you know Montpelier, he rode it from the corner of State and Main down State Street to the site of the then State House, which is where the Supreme Court building is now. But again, we know what he had for breakfast that morning. We know the, uh, we have the text of the orations given to him from the steps of the State House. We know, you know, we know almost everything he did that day and none of the contemporary sources, none of the letters, none of the newspaper accounts or anything like that say, oh, and he rode the Morgan horse. It just doesn't show up. And the horse would have been in Chelsea at the time. So again, keep believing it if you want to. I'm fine with it. Um, so the, the horse uh, figure uh, or Justin Morgan, or the Morgan horse, as he's known by the end of his life, dies in 1821. This is his slightly more modern gravestone. The owners of the farm put it by the side of the road so people would stop jumping that fence and going up the hill <laughs> um, to the original burial site. This was erected by the Morgan Horse Club, which is the predecessor to the American Morgan Horse Association, which a little bit ties into, do you remember me talking about like what makes a breed? It's not just, and this is, this is probably the big, the big Morgan horse myth. You, you'll, you'll see it sometimes. No matter what mare this stallion was bred to, they all turned out looking exactly like him. <laughs> and he single-handedly created a new breed of horse. Genetics do not work that way. I don't need to tell you that. I also think this makes Vermont farmers look really dumb, right? Like, they know what they're doing. They're matching up mares with this stallion to get a certain type. They already have a type in mind. And in fact, some very good historians, some very good equine and Morgan horse historians, actually have a thought that there was kind of a type that lined up with this stallion, maybe already existing in Vermont, like a small, thrifty, um, all-purpose workhorse, that this stallion absolutely clearly like left an impact. Like he made an impact in people's minds, he made a genetic imprint on the horse breeding situation in Vermont. But it seems most likely that what he met up with was a type and that everyone went, oh yeah, oh, this works really well. This is in fact what we want and need out of an all-purpose small farm workhorse. So these are three stallions. Uh, there were something like seven to nine, depending on how you count them, st st breeding stallions that are sons of figure. And these are the three that most Morgan horses today trace their lineage back to. That's Bullrush, Woodbury, and Sherman. And you can already see in that first generation, there's, there's a little, they're a little different from each other. 
And they're in fact going to continue to have sort of different lines and different types of Morgans. Uh, and that's going to continue through till today. Um, there are still different types of Morgans today. On the left there, we have what a lot of people would describe as like a true throwback foundation style Morgan. This is still a breeding stallion in Vermont today. He's in Wethersfield. He is unbelievable in person. He has incredible presence. Uh, on the right there, we have a more modern, what you would call like a sport type Morgan. That is going to be your more typical, um, what you'll see at like a national, horse, national Morgan horse show. Uh, they're both genetically, per the stud book, lineage-wise Morgan horses. Um, but like with any breed, you do get variations within that breed. I mean, by like within 50 years, the Woodbury and the Sherman people were getting into fist fights at state fairs over which lineage was better. So this is like, this is not a new uh, argument. This is not a new uh, difference between the two horses. The Morgan horse remains today, as I'm sure you know, uh, the official Vermont state mammal. Just mammal, not animal, mammal. Um, and... Uh, it's still, uh, although the American Morgan Horse Association has now moved out of Vermont, there still is a Vermont Morgan Horse Association. Um, there are still a ton of Morgan Horse breeders in Vermont, and a lot of them do specialize in that uh, sort of old foundation style uh, look that you might see on the left. Uh, of course, the UVM Morgan Horse Farm in Weybridge is a breeding center for Morgan horses as well. That was actually originally Joseph Battelle's uh, breeding farm. Um, he both recorded and bred uh, Morgan horses. He was in, we could do a whole talk on him. He's an interesting guy. The last thing I want to leave you with um, is this book, which is the way that most people learn about Morgan horse history today. Uh, and I want you to think of a little bit, because this is just another piece in that storytelling, myth-making part that has become part of the history of this horse. Uh, this is Margaret Henry's first book about horses. Um, she had been writing actually travel books uh, before then, and um, she wanted to write a book about horses. She had always loved the story of the Morgan horse, and she starts writing this, this book, I believe in 1942 or 43. She actually comes to Vermont and does research in Vermont to write this book, but she publishes it in 1945. That is like the perfect moment in 20th century American history to publish a book telling the story of an American icon, uh, a, an early American Republic, an early state of Vermont patriotic figure. And in fact, she ends the book with that story of Monroe riding the horse in the parade. And in her book, if you've read it, you know, she often has like a small child narrator who is at the center of the story. And in that book, it's Joel Goss, who is one of the names of the people who's supposed to have owned the horse. And uh, he's apparently lent his horse to the president to ride. And afterwards, people crowd around him. And they say, oh, they'd forgotten, apparently. Who is this horse? Where did he come from? And the last page of the book, Margaret Henry has Joel Goss say to this crowd, I guess we'll never know who he really is or where he really came from. The important thing is that he's American, just like you and me. <laughs> right? Which just. Land, and it's literally the last line of the book. It just lands that whole story right through. So that's what I will leave you with today as the story of this horse in early Vermont history and the role he has played in, in, our, in our Vermont imagination about Vermont history. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I hope that was worth the wait. <laughs> And I will, and any questions that anyone has, I'm happy to, to talk about or, or answer. Or if you just want to share you like your own Morgan horse stories, those are always great. Do I, you know, I usually start by asking how many horse people we have in the audience. Okay, all right, yeah, and a few, <laughs> more than a few. Sometimes it's like three quarters and then I get a little worried. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yep. Supposedly. Supposedly. <laughs> yeah, for where yeah, for where the, the homestead was when you moved to Vermont. Yeah. It's a it's a trot it's an undersaddle trotting race for now, right? Am I remembering that correctly? Yeah. And driving. And driving. Okay. Yep. They also do a um a Justin Morgan 
uh, contest is not the right word, but like a Justin Morgan, uh, anyway, challenge at the, um, the Morgan Horse Show that goes on in Tunbridge every year, where you have to ride, drive, pull a stone boat, show in hand, I think. Yep. Yep. The three, yeah, the three, yeah, the three things. It's meant to. It's meant to do that. The reflect on that same thing that the original horse is supposed to have done. He could. He could do a little bit of everything, um, and so it's meant to reflect a, a horse. And they have different classes um, for geldings, mares, and stallions um, to to compete in that today. So, actually, that picture of um, there he is of um, that's Weathermont Ethan Allen is the name of that stallion. That's at Tunbridge. So, yep. So, yeah. Any other questions or Morgan Horse stories? Yeah. I had, I had a Morgan who was exactly like he could describe. Yeah. I know the better I saw him. Yeah, that's often people say about Morgan horses that they have personality to burn, to say the least. We've got someone back there. I was just wondering whether some of your research involved the stallion certificates that were in the town offices. 
Um, so they didn't, you're talking about the, the, the um, I'm sorry, my brain just fizzed out there. The, um, the grand list uh, property tax values and things yeah, like that. They yeah, they are largely not extant um, today, unfortunately. Uh, not, 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 largely not extant today, largely gone um, today. Yeah, so I, this is, this is a, yeah, this is a level <laughs> that I want to get to. It's, the rabbit holes are endless. I, I literally, at one night after dinner, I was like, I'm going to start just going through and writing down the first generation mayors and putting them on a Google map. And then it was 4 a.m. And I was like, OK. <laughs> I'm still not even half done yet. And not all, like you have to, Battelle and Lindsley are both making what they have to do, which is judgment calls. Sometimes they're putting a mayor in saying, reputed to have been a daughter of figure or out of a Morgan mayor or something like that, but like, hat, like we're in the realm of some real, real fuzziness here. Uh, it's, it's really hard to, um, to track that first generation down. And I also, like I have a, as I mentioned before, if this horse moves all around the state for 25 years straight, he had, like people had to have mentioned him in, in letters, in passing, in something like that that we still just don't know about. This is part of the pitch for like, getting all of our historical records digitized and getting our town records and our local historical society records at least indexed so that you can go and like, oh yeah, there's a whole cache of letters that cover that time period. It's, we're at the level of like the unbelievably painstaking work um, to dig this out, so yeah. Any other questions? We just visited the Justin Morgan marker in the Randolph Center. Is that mm -hmm. so funny? Apparently that's not where he's buried though. The, um, the man is buried in Randolph. Yeah. The horse is buried in Chelsea. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> it, yeah, it is because the horse gets known by his name by the end of his life. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, the it is. In the Randolph Historical Society, actually. Yep. Yeah. Nope. It's in the Randolph Historical Society. I can picture where it is. They have actually a great museum if you ever want to visit it. Um, I know it's very literally open, but if you can talk them into opening it for you, it's great. And the gravestone is in the Randolph Historical Society. It's um, it's not in great shape, so they had removed it to to make sure it was safe and put a new one there. Yeah. No, it wasn't in great shape, and they were worried it would degrade further. So, yeah. You may have. I don't remember. I don't know when it was moved. Yeah. I don't know. I have a picture on my phone somewhere. Um, I had forgotten it was, in, yeah, the original one. I had forgotten it was in the Randolph Historical Society and I was there, gosh, this has been right before COVID um, researching catamount history because there was a catamount signing in Randolph in the 1940s and they have um, casts of the prints. But I like turned around and there was his gravestone. So anyway, <laughs> any other, um, any other questions or comments? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I often say there's a certain type of person who just gets it early and can't shake it. When we were first married, they had a big Morgan horse first show out of um, on the uh, stock farm road. Oh yeah. The, um, oh my gosh, why can't I remember their name? Thank you. <laughs> the Lippet stock farm, yep. Yep. Any other questions? All right. Thank you, everyone. Sure.